Hi, I'm Brian Roach, Senior Research Associate at the Global Development and Environment Institute. And I'm here today with Jim Boyce, who is a co-recipient of the 2017 Leontief Prize for Advancing the Frontiers of Economic Thought. Uh, congratulations, Jim, on receiving Thank the award. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. Uh, the title of today's event is Economics, Equity, and the Environment. Uh, and those three words essentially sum up a lot of your research. Right? And you've looked at the relationship between inequality and the environment in both directions. So let's first take the direction that higher levels of inequality foster higher levels of environmental degradation. Uh, by what mechanisms uh, does that occur? Well, when we're talking here about inequality, what we're thinking about are really two sorts of inequalities. One is inequality of uh, income or wealth, which translates into purchasing power. And the other is inequality in the distribution of what you might call political power or influence, the capacity to influence decisions that aren't made in the market, that's where purchasing power works, but are made by governments, by firms, by civil society. And in both respects, disparities in power have a lot to do with the dynamics of environmental degradation. The reason being that the benefits from activities that degrade the environment aren't randomly distributed, nor are the costs. And in general, not always, but in general, those who benefit the most from environmentally degrading activities, either because they own the firms and get the profits from these activities, or because they consume a lot of stuff and don't have to pay as much for the things they're consuming, tend to be relatively wealthy and therefore relatively powerful people, both in terms of purchasing power and in terms of political power. And those who bear the costs tend to be people with less power, less purchasing power and less political power. So the wider the disparities between those who benefit and those who are harmed by these activities, the more we can expect them to take place. Okay, and there's empirical evidence supporting that in both developed and developing countries? There is. There could be uh, more and should be more research done to, to establish all the mechanisms by which this happens, but there's pretty clear evidence, uh, both internationally and uh, domestically here in the United States, that where disparities of wealth and power are greater, you tend to get more uh, environmental degradation. Uh, let's talk about it in the other direction which would be that high levels of environmental degradation lead to higher levels of inequality. Uh, so, so what are the mechanisms that, that lead to that? Right, well, as I mentioned, it tends to be the case that environmental costs don't just ran, rain down randomly on the population. They're not impartial negative externalities. They tend to disproportionately accrue to those people who don't have the purchasing power to avoid these costs and don't have the political power to avoid these hazards being inflicted on them and on their communities. So for that reason, um, the environmental impacts of degradation exacerbate inequalities that already exist in terms of wealth and power. And that's not only a problem in terms of people's right to a clean and safe environment, important as that is, but it also turns out to have important consequences in terms of their health, in terms of their economic well-being, uh, in terms of days lost from work due to illness or due to staying home to take care of children who are too sick to go to school, et cetera. So these environmental impacts have an effect on people's lives, not just on the environment, and those uh, effects on people are exacerbating the inequalities that in turn help to drive environmental degradation in the first place. Given the, these linkages uh, between inequality and the environment, uh, that presents an opening as far as policy, right? That we don't necessarily need separate policies to deal with inequality and the environment, but we can tackle both of them with well-designed policies. And I know a lot of your research has focused on trying to develop those policies. Uh, I want to focus on cap and dividend, one I know you're a sure. big fan of. So maybe some people aren't quite so familiar with that relative to, say, uh, climate change policies like cap and trade or a carbon tax. Uh, what's so special about cap and dividend? Well, um, let me start with cap and trade, and then I'll differentiate. So cap and trade really ought to be called cap and giveaway and trade, because what happens with a cap and trade system 
is we put a limit on the total amount of emissions. We issue permits up to that limit, it gradually decreases uh, over time, and we uh, give those permits away to the polluters, usually based on their historic levels of pollution, and we allow them to trade among themselves. That's cap and give away and trade. Cap and dividend uh, is quite different in that we put a cap on emissions, but we don't give away the permits. Instead, we auction the permits. The firms have to compete for the permits and bid uh, money. And uh, the, therefore, there's no need for trading. It's not a, a trading system. It's the same kind of system that we have here in the northeastern United States under REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative for power plants. Every three months, they buy permits in an auction. And once that auction takes place, the revenue that's collected by the auctioneer, by the state or the government, can be distributed. One way to distribute it is through what are called dividends, equal payments per person to every woman, man, and child in the jurisdiction imposing the cap and creating the cap and dividend system. That could be a state, it could be a national government. And the effect of doing so is to protect the purchasing power of the bulk of the population. Because when you put on a cap like that, it's going to raise prices of fossil fuels, and those price increases are going to be passed along to the public. Now, finally, the difference between a carbon tax, that's actually a rather small difference. A tax just sets the price and allows the quantity of emissions to fluctuate. A cap sets the quantity and allows the price to fluctuate. Otherwise, they're the same thing. You can have a tax or fee and dividend policy as well. Many people propose such a thing. That can achieve the same results with one proviso, which is that there are hard quantitative targets uh, in that, in, that are part of the legislation, part of the policy for emissions reductions. And if the tax isn't set initially high enough to achieve those targets, the tax automatically goes up. This is what Switzerland does, for example, in its carbon dioxide levy for uh, power plants. It has automatic increases in the levy when emissions reductions targets aren't met. Okay. So in principle, a carbon tax or a cap and dividend could generate the same amount of revenue and thus the same dividends. Exactly. Yeah. And those dividend payments, because they accrue equally to all, regardless of their carbon footprints, benefit low-income households more than upper-income households because upper-income households pay more into the pie because they consume more fossil fuels and low-income households pay less. And yet everybody gets back the same amount. Of course, everyone has the incentive to reduce their own consumption, but in general, it's easier for the poor to have a small carbon footprint because they don't have as much purchasing power to begin with. Do you have a rough idea how much money we're talking about in terms of, say, an annual dividend? Well, it depends uh, how high the price is set. But if we imagine here in the United States a trajectory of carbon prices that would be consistent with the goal of reducing our emissions 40% by the year 2030 and 80% by the year 2050, which is what a lot of the climate scientists recommend, roughly speaking, back of the envelope calculations, the total amount of money that we're talking about that's paid by consumers of fossil fuels over that period between now and 2050 is probably going to be in the neighborhood of $5 trillion. So that's $5 trillion that are being paid by consumers of fossil fuels. And the question is, who gets the money? Under cap and giveaway and trade, the money goes to the people who got free permits, the corporations, right? Uh, if the government keeps the money, they can do what they want with it. If they dividend it back to the public, that's money that goes uh, into people's uh, bank accounts uh, and helps to protect their purchasing power, as I've said, from the impact of higher fuel prices and thus helps to ensure the political durability of the program, the sustainability of the program. If the revenue is distributed, I believe, in a fair and transparent manner, people are going to support the program. And if it's not, as the prices go up, I'm afraid that that support uh, could weaken over time. Now, some people might hear about this policy and think, well, that's some far left liberal idea. But I know just last month, a group of prominent Republicans, uh, including uh, former secretaries of state, uh, George Shultz, uh, Jim Baker came out under uh, with a rather similar program, right? I think theirs was yep. a tax and dividend. Yep. So why should this appeal to conservatives as well as more progressive people? 
Well, I think there are a couple reasons why conservatives uh, can, and in, in this case, have gotten on board with the idea. One is that this doesn't increase the size of government. Um, George W. Bush used to say, it's your money, right? Well, this, it, this is taking the principle that it is the people's money, that they're paying to use the scarce carbon absorptive capacity of the atmosphere, and it goes back to the people because we all own that uh, capacity together. It doesn't uh, make the state any bigger. So that's one reason. A second reason is that a carbon price uh, creates a level playing field. It doesn't favor some businesses or some sectors or some fuels against others, right? It doesn't try to pick winners and losers. It uses the price as an instrument to drive down emissions, and conservatives tend to like that. Um, one last thing I should say about this is that for a long time, many conservatives had a different preference. If there was going to be a carbon tax or a carbon price, they wanted to use that money to cut other taxes, particularly corporate income taxes. And this was uh, ostensibly going to help grow the economy. Um, but it's striking that Secretary Baker, Secretary Schultz, and several prominent economists who are associated with that position, like Martin Feldstein and Gregory Mankiw at Harvard, um, actually have now come around to the view that dividends is the way to go. It's a way to actually get a policy in place. And I hope that liberals will similarly have the political maturity and wisdom to come around to that position as well, because they too have their favored uses of the money. Rather than giving it to the people, they have pet projects or constituencies they would like to, to satisfy, just as corporate income tax cuts satisfy a Republican constituency. And I think what we really need to have a durable climate policy is a bipartisan policy that will retain public support regardless of who's in the White House, regardless of who's going to be controlling Congress for the three decades or so it takes to complete the clean energy transition. So I think we're making steps in that direction. And the Republican proposal, um, or at least the proposal from the Republican side that, uh, that you described, is a really encouraging step in that direction. Right. And once people are getting these annual dividend checks, obviously they have an incentive to keep the policy in place and, and keep the money rolling in. Absolutely right. I mean, that's part of the idea, Brian. And uh, you can see it happening already in Alaska, where starting in the early 80s, a permanent fund was established that takes oil revenues from that state and recycles them to the public, to every woman, man, and child, as an equal annual dividend. This is not rocket science. This is totally doable. And that policy was put in place by a Republican governor. It enjoys very strong bipartisan support, both from voters and from legislators. People like it. People like getting that check. Sure. Sounds great. All right. Well, hey, thanks a lot, Jim. Uh, and congratulations again on okay. the uh, 2017 right. thanks, prize. Yeah. Thanks All very right. much. Thank you.